with this poem just as we start. So the poem's called The Size of the Love Bruise. So he writes, the gauge, G-A-U-G-E. Gauge. Gauge, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't spoken English for that long. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The gauge of a good poem, and we're going to call it the gauge of a good weekend. Right? The gauge of a good poem is the size of the love bruise it leaves mm. on your neck, or the size of the love bruise it can paint on your brain or your heart, or the size of the love bruise it can weave into your soul, or indeed, it could be all of the above. So blessings for sacred love bruises. They shouldn't hurt too much. They should be gentle. You know, to be struck by Cupid's arrow, but the arrow which isn't, you know, mischievous, as it is in the Greek tradition. For the Greeks, Cupid's arrow is completely capricious, meaning mm -hmm. you're just walking through your life, minding your own business, and there's Cupid's arrow. Oh my God, that was the image of the Greek gods. Mm -hmm. In the kind of deeper tradition, right, Cupid's arrow is very specific. And the way the Kabbalists, and that's my tradition, my lineage is a Kabbalah lineage, the way my lineage masters would say it, is that everyone who's in this room was meant to be in this room from before the first six days of creation. That the exact group of people came together who needed to create this infinitely unique moment in time, which never has been, and which never will be. In Hebrew, the word time is zman, is invitation. We're invited to something here. We're not sure quite what the full contours of the invitation are, but what I can promise, what we can promise together, what, what the time promises, is the time holds within it the eternity that resides in a moment. And that we have the ability, if we can create something here, right, to shift something, to move something, not only in ourselves, and ourselves includes each one of us, but also if we can shift something here and allow something to come together in Sangha, in Buddha and in Dharma, Right, in community, right, in the I, and in Dharma, and in the teaching, that something will also shift right, in, in all of the worlds, and we'll do some healing you know, for all sentient beings. Amen. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to actually kind of move right into a, a integral space, and we're, I'm going to set something up for you to explore together and it'll, we'll use it as a kind of introduction to each other and then when we debrief it we'll get to know each other a little bit also. So one of the definitions of enlightenment, and this comes from Kabbalah, is enlightenment is the ability to change perspectives. And um, we're going to talk, we're going to practice changing perspectives all weekend but we're also going to infuse those perspectives with love. That's the, that's the part that's going to be added this weekend. So we're going to work with perspectives, but we're going to see what's it like to really inhabit, embody, and love those particular perspectives. So everybody here, I think, is familiar with Interval, right? No, somebody. And Jason. <coughs> Jason is not. Okay, so good. So, so I'll, I'll talk about this for you, okay? <coughs> what if, probably... The most, it might be the most significant insight of Ken Wilbur's, and one, one that a lot of the work that we do with Integral, um, what it turns on and what, what it opens up is that language, language itself frames three really fundamental points of view. <coughs> In all languages, when we speak to each other, there are three reference points that get created. The first first one is the subject. What is that? I. I. I, right? I. The second one is you, right? And the third one is it. And what Ken discovered is that once he started to see that clearly, he realized that every human, every endeavor, human endeavor could be placed in one of those three categories. So science is all about it. Right? Zen is all about I. Right? Um, <coughs> mysticism, all, all devotional religion is second person. It's all about thou. And that one of the reasons why, like Diane, um, or Barbara Walters, when she does her bringing the scientists together with the religious people, one of the reasons that that can never be a really full conversation mm -hmm. is because nobody is paying attention to this difference. 
that that in endeavors that have to do with I are very sp different by their nature. Science requires that you're separate from it, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You can't have a scientific question if you don't create a subject-object split. In Zen, as long as there's a subject-object split, there's no enlightenment, there's no realization. Zen practice has to do with dissolving the subject-object split. And in the second person, the entire communication or the entire um, reality of the second person relies on communication. If you're not communing with God, there is no, there's nothing happening. Does that make sense to everybody? So these three perspectives become really important because they create a way for us to understand what's happening in, um, in our experience. So we want to kind of start by exploring those three points of view. So I, you, and it. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a little <coughs> exercise where you're going to be in groups of three, and you're going to take each one of those perspectives. So you're going to begin as I, and you're going to speak about your most significant spiritual opening, if you will, or the thing in your, a moment in your life where, from a spiritual perspective, something turned. Maybe it was the loss of a friend, maybe you had a big opening in meditation, maybe you were drawn to some kind of spiritual community and something happened for you, but you're just going to describe to the other two people in your group what that was for you, okay? Now, if you're the second person, you're going to listen, and you're going to listen as a kind of a way of communing or really receiving the other person. So when you're in the first, you're going to speak and tell your experience. When you're in the second position, your whole job is to listen. You can ask questions, you can clarify, but you're basically going to listen. And when you're in the third position, <coughs> you're going to be a witness. You're going to take the it where you're not actually in the exchange, you're not referencing your experience, but you're just watching from a kind of neutral, objective point of view. So we're going we're gonna to have an experience of these three different perspectives. Does that make sense? Yeah, maybe just to say, to, to pick up on, on what Diane's just kind of laid out so elegantly, the, these three faces <laughs> of experience, this first person, second person, third person, which is one of the great ideas in perennial philosophy that you know, Ken's really picked up and elucidated it beautifully. It's a clear, it's what, you know, uh, you know, one of the things Ken likes to quote is Leibniz. Right? And Leibniz um, has his great idea of the philosophy of Perennius. And there's a great book that I actually just read for the first time this year by Aldous Huxley called The Perennial Philosophy. Just one of these bad mic actually by a lot, and he's, he's reading it now. Dan's husband, Michael. And in The Perennial Philosophy, you know, Leibniz talks about what are the great ideas that actually every great system in the world shared in common. And of course, as Alan Watts correctly pointed out, right, this is one of the great kept secrets of humanity, that actually, underneath all of the disagreement, that which unites us right, is far greater than that which divides us. <laughs> that there's actually a philosophy of Perennius, right, which actually unites. It's, an, it's a stunning idea. If we actually just stopped the entire weekend and just talked about that idea, like, oh my God, that there's actually agreement in the entire planet across geographical times and across temporal frames, in <clears throat> temporal meaning time, that everybody actually agrees about ten major things. That piece of information isn't flashing on the Bloomberg you know, wire service, but it's actually the single most exciting, compelling, and hopeful piece of information right, available. So one of those ten core ideas in the philosophy of Perennius is this notion that there are three perspectives. Right? That there's I, we, in it, that these three perspectives exist, right? and, and, and everyone, and what, what Ken writes in the beginning of Sex, Ecology, and Spirituality is that his job was to pick up these core ideas in the parental philosophy and then to weave them together, I think his image is like a necklace, mm -hmm. to weave them as a necklace, right? and that Ken's great contribution is the weaving of this necklace, because you could actually not notice that the necklace exists, and so the weaver provides this great gift, this great and gorgeous gift. You know, I, we, and it. And just to maybe double click on it for one more second then pass it back to, to, to Lady Diane, right? The, um, the argument between these three perspectives is enormous. Just think about it for a second. Just think about our own lives. Right? Where are the places that we meet each one of these perspectives? Well, let's think about it for a second. Where do we meet kind of the, ex the first person perspective? We, we meet it in all of our subjective experiences. Right? That's our place of subjective experience. That's first-person subjective experience. You know, in religion, which we'll talk about more on Sunday,